Okay. The question is: the question was if iboga works for any kind of addiction. Um, iboga uh, reduces the or stops the withdrawal from opiates, uh, but it also stops the craving from uh, stimulants, cocaine, uh, methamphetamine, amphetamines. It's also for nicotine, alcohol, benzodiazepines. The only thing is that you cannot detox somebody from alcohol and benzodiazepines uh, without tapering them down because it can be dangerous. You can have what's called an acute uh, alcohol withdrawal seizure with benzos uh, also. And uh, ibogaine is not anti-epileptic, so it would not stop the, the risks of having that. But it's, I mean, there's always the, the, the physical addiction, the psychological addiction, and then there's the whole uh, root of the addiction, you know, the more the, the, the family, the, the na nurture and nature, you know what they say, and um, ibogaine addresses uh, all of those um, aspects both physically, psychologically, and also the experience is very often described as a very profound uh, therapeutic um, experience. The thing is that Ibogaine is like no plant or no pill in the world is able to change the complete social context of the of the addict. So even if somebody gets clean with Ibogaine, he has a, like a framework of uh, weeks to months where he will have no craving, uh, he will not feel depressed, will not feel anxious, and needs to use that framework to really uh, change his life enough to uh, have a satisfying life without having a drug of choice used daily. Thanks for a great talk. It's really interesting the work you do. Uh, so I work in medical research, and I, I must say, as this is a fantastic thing, these plants, but I think to convince the medical community you will need some large clinical studies, uh, preferably double-blind randomized and everything. Uh, so what are your thoughts on that? Is there any work started? Is there anything planned? Well, with uh, Ibogaine there's, um, there's no double-blind study being done. Um, in the case of addiction, and, and um, um, especially opiate uh, um, addiction in severe cases, um, there's no really, uh, not really a place placebo uh, effect. If you would go to uh, an area where there's all uh, heroin addicts, and you would give them placebo, and you would come back the next day, you know, you would probably not get a get out alive. So, in in a lot of studies, there's no placebo uh, condition. But I think with ibogaine, if there would be one cli well done clinical study with a, a double blind study. Um, where Ibogaine is used inside the th therapeutic context, so with a preparation process, with a integ integration process and then a follow-up, that would be something that would be very convincing uh, if the results are uh, positive. And we have been uh, working on a protocol for uh, such study with uh, two investigators that are on the advisory board of, of ICERS. Um, of course, l later on money is a big issue, so it's a very uh, green uh, project. But we want to do it in a, in a center in Brazil. Uh, where they use, uh, it's I think the only center that I know of where Ibogaine is really used in a completely integrated way in a program. So they have a program for um, c cracking cocaine addiction uh, and they basically get people clean without Ibogaine first minimum 20 days. So they do everyday motivational therapy to really work the motivation to get clean. They do family therapy to, um, to prepare the family as well. And then after that period they do the administration of Ibogaine uh, in a clinic, they, in a hospital setting, they uh, stay there for three days and then they continue for uh, I think another 15 days or so the therapy every day, cognitive therapy, uh, family therapy and then they continue doing therapy on a more um, you know, spread um, basis during two years and they have been uh, uh, taking data from uh, patients, uh, from their patients from the beginning and uh, basically from their findings 64% uh, of the patients gets clean, uh, t finishes the two-year program with only one administration of Ibogaine, 64 percent. That's for cocaine addiction, crack cocaine addiction, that's really spectacular amount. And then they have 16 percent on top of that, which are people that have a relapse during the two years, but they take Ibogaine again and they f also finish the, the two-year program. So you could say that 80 percent of their uh, patients have uh, success on a sustained uh, way. Um, that I know they want to do, um, in the meantime, an observational study. I don't know what's the status on that. 
but um, you know, the, uh, with with cocaine, especially where there's no physical uh, withdrawal, it would be possible. And also inside a context where there's a lot of therapy offered, and ibogaine is just the catalyst for the change. It's not the treatment on itself. I think there it's also ethical to uh, work with the double blind condition because you offer people a, a whole program. In one program, you would uh, do it with with a, cat a catalyst, ibogaine, and the other one without, and then compare those uh, data. So we're trying to work on that, but then funding, and I mean, it's it's a difficult process. Thanks. That's uh, great to hear. I think that's the kind of numbers you need to convince mm -hmm. today. Thanks. something uh, about the uh, ecological impact on rainforest for harvest, harvesting all these medical plants? Well, that's a good question because actually in uh, Gabon, um, so Iboga, uh, Ibogaine is made with um, the Tabernant Iboga plant. Um, uh, for, for a long time that was the only way to, to make it. And so basically there's a lot of illegal export from uh, Gabon to other parts of the world. Uh, and that has uh, created problems. I, we've been in touch with uh, the foundation of the First Lady in, in Gabon about this problem. Uh, the, the price of Iboga has raised so much in, in Gabon because of the illegal export and a lot of wild uh, Iboga plants that are very big in the forests in uh, Gabon have, have disappeared. So that makes uh, not only a problem of, of the, um, you know, that there's enough crops to uh, provide the world, but also for the Gabonese themselves, for, to use them in, in their rituals, which is very essential in their culture, they have a problem problem in being able to afford it. So uh, basically they, they have uh, developed a report on, the, on that uh, situation and the Gabonese uh, government is going to, uh, to take measures, I don't know which ones, but uh, that's definitely a problem. But on the other hand now, um, a lot of the biggest part of the Ibogaine has been used in like the official centers in uh, different parts of the world. Uh, it's not being made anymore by with the Tabernanti Boga plant, but with another also African plant, which is called Voacanga Africana, which has a substance called Voacanin. Nothing is known about this substance, which could be also potentially a very therapeutic uh, substance. And then basically in the laboratory they synthesize ibogaine out of it. And they've been doing it in, um, in an FDA approved laboratory in India, uh, according to all the standards, because this type of product is really needed if you want to do clinical uh, trials. You can't just buy some iboga on the internet and then uh, give it to the people. It needs to be f uh, produced under um, certain standards and, and that's what they've been doing. So then, of course, the question is, is there enough Wakanga Africana? I think it's important always to uh, promote sustainable uh, solutions for that. People have also started planting iboga in countries like Brazil. Um, for now, ibogaine, it's, it has grown significantly. I think between 2001 and 2006, it has been is this fourfold at the amount of uh, treatments done with ibogaine. So if it keeps on increasing like that, uh, you know, there must be uh, uh, sources for that provided. And it would be nice if the traditional countries could do that and also have the, their money uh, for it. In the case of ayahuasca, um, what I saw in when I was in Colombia is that with the fumigations for the for the coca plants. Um, a lot of these fumigations didn't happen on the coca plants, but the site on the villages, so the indigenous peoples would uh, go away, or on the forest, and then more coca plants would come. So they basically only destroy coca plants from the small farmers, but the big ones that are linked to the, the paramilitaries and the, the mafia, they, they never are touched. And so uh, there were uh, parts of the Kofan Indians that had troubles, they had to go much further to get their ayahuasca plants because they were so contaminated because of the fumigations. So I think the ecological situation is is a big disaster and it's it's in many countries. I mean, in Ecuador, there was all this uh, stuff going on with the petrol uh, pollution. In Brazil, um, they, they've, uh, they're, deforest, they're doing deforestations that are also endangering this. So I think it's very important to uh, preserve those medicinal plants like many others that come out of, out of the rainforest. Thank you.